Hey everybody, welcome to Team Gavel. I am Jacob Tingen. I'm here with James Williams. Hey everybody. <laughs> and uh, we are your, your uh, lawyers for Law Day, part of Team Gavel. Well, we're well, not your lawyers. I guess it's a good time to play this here. We'll play it. Legal information is not legal advice specific to your situation. Unless we are your lawyers. But we're not your lawyers on the stream, right? So uh, we're only providing info. But today we're going to provide a, a, you know, typically we take one subject and we kind of deep dive on it. Um, or cursory dive on it, you know, uh, depending on what we're talking about and how deep the subject is. But uh, today we're just kind of going to go over a couple of things that are out there and talk about some industry news in the gaming industry. Yeah. So that's yeah. what we're up to today. So, I mean, normally, like Jacob said, we have a very specific topic, but we haven't really done news type updates or discussions about things that are going on. I mean, normally it's, hey, let's talk about a specific practice area. Let's talk about copyright infringement. Let's talk about trademarks. But, you know, once you go through some of the basics, it's interesting to just see what's actually happening, what people are doing and saying. So, um, of course, everybody should be aware that there are, you know, it's con season, uh, convention <laughs> seasons. We've got a whole bunch of conventions that are, of course, still going to be online. There are some that are trying to happen in person, but a lot of the major gaming and entertainment ones are going to be online this year just because nobody wanted to try to plan something and then have to reschedule <laughs> it like last right. year. The last pandemic's year was, not quite over. Last uh, year was rough for everybody. Here in the U.S., we're kind of rounding out um, hopefully the end, but in much of the world, not so much. So, And even many parts of the U.S., um yeah so con season that's pretty exciting right yeah i mean this is where last year i started working with the firm and i was ready <laughs> <laughs> i didn't i didn't go to a lot of cons or any cons actually before which hey that's just how it is but i was ready to go around network check out some of the other stuff uh pax i was gonna potentially go up to magfest because that's closer to where we are and um, yeah, then everything slowly was canceled. But um, E3 is coming up. We've got um, PAX Online, which is also coming up sooner. And um, I mean, they're gonna be talking about a lot of game previews. Are there any games that you've been looking forward to, Jacob? Um, games that I've been looking forward to not, not really. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to one of my favorite authors has some new, I guess, skins coming out on Fortnite. Uh, so <laughs> my, I'm, I'm on a text train with my brothers-in-law and my father-in-law who we play Fortnite together. We're the worst squad in the universe, but it's fun. <laughs> uh, and um, I don't know if you've read Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series. Have you? So Kelsier is one of the characters from that series, and you can now play in Fortnite as Kelsier. So all of us were talking about, oh, man, got to buy Kelsier, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, so that's kind of the biggest kind of like game purchase that I'm potentially looking at, just because it would be awesome to be Kelsier. Yeah, and I mean, that is one of the big value inputs that these types of platforms or uh, publishers like Epic can input into their games and add on to it because normally historically speaking DLCs downloadable content and other things weren't available I mean we've slowly had additional uh, add-ons and other things that you can buy for your game but games like Fortnite where you can continually buy new skins new extensions and expansions it's always really cool to think about just in the sense of like the gaming history, you know, uh, where, where do we start from and how can you continue to make or try to make your product relevant? Whereas a lot of times technology, especially video games gets old over time. Yeah. They might get old. They might not be the, the most current in terms of graphics or other things. And unless of you have a really strong community, you know, the game itself is probably going to die with the times. So it's nice when you have games like that where they're able to tie in other things to kind of keep it 
fresh. Keep it fresh. Yeah, no, I mean, the internet makes that possible. I mean, otherwise, uh, it wouldn't be possible. But it is cool to see kind of this universe expand and um, as they continue to add more and more skins to it. So it's pretty neat. Uh, that's kind of one thing that I've been looking at. Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously a huge... In terms of actual games, I, I've been a... A sucker for any games that Nintendo makes recently, especially <laughs> like within, more specifically within Pokemon or the Zelda franchises. Mm -hmm. So we might get some news about Breath of the Wild 2. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hopeful. Uh, I definitely am looking forward to that. Um, and we already know the new release dates for the new Pokemon games that are coming out. We've got November of this year for the Sinnoh region remake, so Diamond and Pearl, Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, and then the new Pokemon Arceus is coming out in January of next year. So those are all things that I'm looking forward to personally. Um, we've got a whole bunch of publishers, a lot of the big ones that are going to actually be at E3, but Sony's still not going to be there. So uh, some people have been talking about whether or not other publishers like Sony are just going to start offering their own events. So um, like Summer Game Fest or uh, related ones where basically the publisher controls everything and they can just say like, hey, you know, here's our release. Here's our previews. It's just Sony or it's just Blizzard Activision. And um, it'll be kind of in interesting to see what brands do because... Obviously, if you just do your own event, then you can have your own sponsorships, your own license agreements, and a little bit more, I mean, you can frame everything. So whatever you're trying to do, if you want to emphasize particular games, you're no longer just one in the bunch. You are the bunch. Yeah. No, I, I, it's, uh, it's fun to play new games. It's fun to see what's coming out. Um, I know that we were going to talk about E3. When I was looking at that uh, just a couple seconds ago, the thing that I'm actually excited about is not a video game, but uh, I, lately I've been getting into Warhammer. Have I told you about this? Yeah. <laughs> you and I have personally talked about it off stream. Okay. <laughs> right. Right. So uh, War Warhammer Skulls Showcase on June 3rd. So I'm thinking... Tomorrow. Huh, yeah. Right. No, I'm looking at this thinking, <laughs> I need to look at this because... Uh, I got, I, you know, this has been, I, I haven't gone all in. Well, I mean, I guess I've, I bought a whole set of minis, uh, but like one of the giant box sets, um, and I'm painting them slowly. Uh, when you have kids and every time you want to paint, they're like, can we paint two dead? And then you don't paint anything. <laughs> um, so it's been a little slow going, but I just, I, I really enjoy it. And it's funny because when I got minis, my wife was all like, there's no way you're going to do this. Like, you can't color within the lines because you're too impatient. And I'm all like, no, trust me, this will be cool. And, and it has been. It's really like one of those oddly soothing things to just be able to paint minis and, you know. But um, I saw this on the E3 uh, w uh, link here, and I was just thinking, man, I should, I should look at that. So anyway, that's what was on my brain as we were talking. Yeah, and I mean, w we have a Tech Radar uh, article where – They've compiled a lot of the different events that are coming up around E3. So, like, one of the other ones, the Indie Live Expo, will be interesting. I I mean, it's always really cool to see what the big brands are doing, the big publishers. But, I mean, last year, I liked playing Bug Snacks, and I liked playing um, Going Under, which are some of the more indie game publishers. And it's just a good reminder to, you know keep an eye out for some of those games because just because they're not from a big IP and intellectual property like Sony or Nintendo doesn't necessarily mean anything. <laughs> I mean, right. maybe, maybe it just means, Hey, they've got less funding or maybe the graphics won't be at the same par or the same level, but otherwise you can enjoy a game that's made by a smaller indie developer just as much, if not more than you know, a triple A publisher. So that's definitely something else I'm going to be keeping an eye out for just to see what other people are recommending. And hopefully, hopefully we'll have some other content, some other games we might be able to try out for our stream. Yeah. Maybe we should spend some time on some indie games on our, on our Friday game day. 
Um, for those of you who follow us, uh, you already know this, but for those of you who are new to us, Wednesday is Law Day, Friday is Game Day, and it's been, it's been fun to play some of the games that we've taken a look at. Um, and most recently, we were playing um, Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. Last, last week, you played Resident Evil, right? Yeah. I mean, I've been playing Resident Evil outside, like this past week, and I played a bit. And then um, I was playing the new Pokemon Snap before, so that was pretty fun. Um, obviously, both of those are by you know big IPs, Capcom, Nintendo, Pokemon Company. But um, yeah, I'm hoping to look into some of the other games that are from maybe some of the smaller developers going forward. I mean, I've got a laundry list of games that I was told I need to get caught up on. Like I'm, <laughs> I started Bioshock because of uh, one of my mentors and I kind of got distracted because there were so many new games that I had already pre-ordered that came in. <laughs> so yeah, I told myself, all right, once I go through this uh, current little bout with Resident Evil Village, I'm going to pick back up in some of the other games that I kind of left. So, yeah, that's that's a fun little moment there when you're like, ooh, piece of candy. Ooh, another <laughs> game, another game. And, yeah, it, I have a lot of games I haven't it, played. It's an interesting <laughs> phenomenon, you know, because when you're growing up and when you talk to other people and, and that aren't into games, they're like, oh, you should really read this book or you should really see this movie. But it's interesting to be, you know, you should, re you should really play this game. Uh, it's kind of the same feeling, you know, and, and it's interesting how communities can share you know these shared experiences that that really identify them um, and games are, are no exception when it comes to the media world so um i hope you enjoy getting caught up james yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i've definitely had a good time with a lot of the games that i've been picking up i've got i'm supposed to pick up final fantasy i saw that in the playstation store mm. for a discount the the remake so um that's on my list and I know that the fact that it's a remake has some people on edge because some people say you should play the original one the original of Final Fantasy 7 mm, okay. but um, at the same time it was on sale and I got it so <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some improvements yeah. when they remake a game like the ability to save more frequently <laughs> yeah these these are good things um, and I think this is a good segue into one of the other topics we wanted to cover. But um, speaking about Final Fantasy in particular, d did you ever play the uh, like the original Nintendo, not SNES? I'm talking about NES, Final Fantasy. No, okay. I, I like I missed the whole series because I just didn't have anybody that was actively telling me about okay, it. Okay, okay. So, so uh, when I was growing up, it was like my brother's game. Like, I was, you know, it's a little older than me even, right, in terms of me playing it. Uh, but I, I actually recently found it um, on, on the iPad, of all things. Um, and they actually have, like, all of the original games kind of, like, redone for, for, you know, mobile devices. And so I've been playing the original Final Fantasy with my kids going through the storyline and actually playing through, frankly, for the first time in my life, but having lots and lots of nostalgia from watching my brothers play late into the night. Uh, so that's been good, but it's, it's interesting to see how some of these IPs kind of continue to stay alive, even though we have moved on to bigger and better graphics. Um, some stories just continue to live, and um, I know we wanted to talk about uh, ROM Universe, uh, which is one man's effort, ill-fated, <laughs> to keep certain IPs alive. You want to you talk about that for a bit? Okay, yeah. So there was a lawsuit that was recently uh, not settled, but uh, concluded. Basically, um, what's his name? Matthew Storman. Uh, he worked with the website ROM Universe, and basically, if you know anything about ROMs, there's ROMs for a whole bunch of games that were uploaded to the website. And what made it especially problematic, I mean, just having it where you can download other games, like additional copies of games, is bad. But um, in terms of legally speaking, <laughs> um, he also had subscriptions 
So if you paid for a certain subscription, you could get access to more content, that sort of thing. And um, Nintendo didn't like it. Nintendo's pretty aggressive on protecting their IP, especially when money is involved. And um, last year, they started uh, the trial process and it just finished not too long ago, but they were asking for $15 million <laughs> in damages. And uh, they asked for statutory copyright infringement damages, which can be from anywhere between $35,000 per act of infringement all the way up to potentially $150,000 per act of infringement. So right. that's every single copy of a game that's being reproduced, every single <laughs> distribution of right. additional copies. Each of those actions counts as one in one infringement. infringement count. Each action could potentially be up to 150,000, right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, they usually steer away from the higher amounts unless if they can show willful infringement. Somebody who says, ah, you know. I don't care. I know that this is copyright infringement. I'm going to do it anyway. Right. Yeah. If you've got documents where you say, you know, forget Nintendo. I just want to do this. I know this is wrong. Then don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, there's your legal information. But anyway, um, th I guess before we go into too much like ragging on this particular individual, it, it is important to say that this person, uh, the owner of ROM Universe, went into it pro se. So uh, this means that the person did not have legal counsel. And I mean, I don't want to shame any particular person just because they couldn't afford legal counsel, but just knowing that anytime you go up against a big IP uh, like Nintendo, you're, you're, I mean, the bar is going to be really high. Right. And um, let, let me let me throw this in here. Hold on. Go ahead. Legal information is not legal advice specific to your situation. No. What what I would say though is if you know. If you're looking at $15 million of damages, hire an attorney, <laughs> right? Like it might have been worth it to go into a little bit of debt to not be in debt to the tune of 2 million. Um, so I would just, it, it uh, not that it would necessarily would have turned out differently. Um, you know, it, it clearly he had on his website that he was hosting, you know, copyright material, which is something we've talked about a lot, you know, and, and, and you know, we've talked about, what happens on Twitch as well, that it, technically it's all, you know, copyright infringement. Um, but it's permitted because people, I mean, people, copyright holders, you know, permit it through the Twitch platform because it tends to, to work out good for, you know, video game developers and that kind of thing. Um, but but uh, when you've got a case where, you know, you've got a juggernaut coming after you, you should probably, you know, lawyer up. We, we sell t-shirts that say that. So <laughs> uh, it's generally a good idea. Um, and, I, and I think that that's, Fair to say, and that's not within the realm of legal advice. That's that's just good advice. Period. Um, James. Yeah, and I mean, the what's important to note. We talked about this before, actually, on one of our game day streams. Uh, we had Matt in our chat who was talking about some of his pro se experiences. Yeah. The judge usually will consider the fact that a party is pro se as they make their determinations. So even though, you know, the Nintendo's lawyers are very buttoned up, they've got their arguments presumptively uh, perfect, ready to go, the judge will consider, I mean, it, it's always, there are a lot of things that come down to judicial discretion and copyright infringement is one of those areas. So it's up to the judge and or the jury if applicable to decide are they going to award $35,000 or are they going to award $150,000 per act of infringement. Nintendo had asked for $90,000 per act of infringement, which is how they got, you know, $15 million. But the judge just being aware of the process, I guess, and maybe taking a little pity because it was clear infringement happened 
So uh, probably looked at the guy, said, you know what? You'll be just fine if you get your $35,000 per act of infringement. And this guy is probably not going to be able to do much else. So, you know, what's the difference in getting $2 million where you may or may not even get all of that uh, versus the $15 million where you're probably not going to see that. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, they always say this in law school, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip. So um, I I think in in a case like this, and and I can't read Nintendo's mind, right? But um, presumably they're trying to stop the behavior more than they're after the money. Of course, it, it appears that, you know, ROM Universe profited off of uh, making this IP available and, and for, for download, right? Um, and so, you know, I, there's evidence that he knew he was profiting off of this stuff. Um, and, and so there's that. But at the end of the day, I don't think they were after money so much as they were, like, after stopping this behavior. And, and so maybe they wanted some money. Uh, you know, I don't think many law... It's not often that you sue for, you know, $10 million and get $10 million. Um, you know, most cases settle. Uh, and, and I'm sure that had there been a little bit more, uh, perhaps if a lawyer had been involved, there would have been the option for settlement instead of actually going to a trial and, and that kind of thing. Well, so. yeah, and that was one of the things about this case in particular. It started with a cease and desist. And then, uh, you know, a, a DMCA takedown request. But this guy said no <laughs> and started to respond. So Sorry, I shouldn't have laughed when you said that. <laughs> I mean, it's just one of those things. This is where it becomes very important to talk about the significance of filing a counter notice. So um, I can't remember the name, but there were some modders for... Uh, GTA 5 and they had recently uploaded their own mods and things and that wasn't something that um, (laughs) was accepted by the you know the owners the publishers for GTA Grand Theft Auto and they filed a DMCA notice and the people filed a counter notice they got the content uploaded because that's just how the DMCA statute works. But just like what happened with um, Mr. Storman and Brom Universe, the only option to stop this activity is for the IP, the brand owner, the publisher, to sue the individual and pursue it in court. So, you know, I haven't seen anything filed in that particular case, but... You know, if you file a counter notice, you have to expect either it's going to stop because they'll understand or accept whatever your argument is, or if you throw something out that's really bogus, they're going to sue you. (laughs) (laughs) And in this particular Nintendo case, they didn't buy it. And um, yeah, the court didn't buy the rationale either. So he got sued. They uh, did the original trial to determine, and I guess this is just one of those other areas where we could explain the process for courts. Um, They did the original trial just to determine whether copyright infringement occurred, and then they had a separate proceeding to determine damages. So that's how we ended up with, okay, now that we've determined it. That uh, you are liable, how much, how much, how, to what, to what amount are you liable? Yep. So that's how we got the two point, or I'll just read it, $2,115,000 in damages. So good luck paying that off. And then uh, some of the other things, we kind of touched on it, but um, there have been a lot of, well, okay. If you have a Twitch account, which presumptively people do to watch our content, then you probably got a, an email from Twitch saying we got more a bunch DMCA of DMCA's, t- <laughs> right? Yeah, they're we got, coming. We got more DMCA notices, so uh, you know, please get your act together. This is just a good general reminder: if it's not your music, do not use it unless if you <laughs> unless if you can verify that the music is royalty free. 
Um, not copyright free, that, that doesn't really make sense. The copyright's still going to be there. It's just whether or not um, the person is actively pursuing their royalties or uh, enforcing the copyrights. But they're always going to have copyright protection because at least by US standards, as soon as the work is fixed, the copyright is created. Exactly, and so, um, and we've talked about this before, DMCA claims on Twitch. So if you're receiving a DMCA takedown notice, um, you, you might wanna review some of our prior videos uh, where we've talked about DMCA and Twitch and, um, and in particular music. But like James said, in, in order to keep you know, your audio alive and to keep your videos alive, uh, when you do use music, use uh, quote unquote royalty free music. Uh, you can find music that you that that it, you can purchase music for this purpose. Uh, sometimes you can find websites where there's free music for this purpose, but you want to make sure you take a careful look at uh, licenses and make sure that you're using the music in the right way. Yeah, like for some of the streams where I was concerned about the music, the gameplay audio, I played using High Pass GG, and um, they're one of the services that offers it for free. They suggest that it's uh, been cleared and ready for streaming and uh, recorded VODs. So that's one of them. Uh, some of the other ones that we talk about are Monster Cat and um, Pretzel Rocks. Both of those involve paid subscriptions though. So you just wanna keep in mind that sometimes it takes a financial investment, but you know, this is, a business if you're going to stream as a business anyway and if it's not a business then you just have to keep in mind that there are going to be legal consequences or other financial consequences if you don't you know clear go through and check all of the boxes you need to for your compliance checklist so that's why we always talk about making sure that you know what you have to do as a, a streamer or a content creator it, it doesn't matter whether you're doing stuff for fun or as a business, everybody has to play by the same rules. And obviously if you're trying to make money, you should take a little bit more of a cautious eye and um, be that more uh, cautious type of approach. Right, yeah, and, and, and you know, especially if you're trying to run a business, right? Because the last thing you want is to build up a base of content, have it disappear, uh, earn some revenue and have to pay out $2 million to Nintendo because you didn't dot your, t dot your I's and cross your T's. So, um, and that's the message for you. Uh, so yeah, I mean, DMCA, copyright, these things are important and we hope that, um, you know, that the information we provided on our stream is helpful for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to touch briefly on some of the other things that have gone on. Like okay. Euro Eurovision, we, got, we saw a lot of people who were broadcasting that. Just as a reminder, there are certain things that you can broadcast and certain things you can't. So if it's <laughs> just going to be content, I mean, if you're re-watching something that's being shared on a TV network, then odds are there's copyright protections and you probably don't have a license to stream it. But right. remember, copyrights can exist in multiple layers like a sandwich. If you've got the license to talk about, you know, commentate on a particular event like Eurovision, then does the same rule apply for other types of content that are happening simultaneously? You know, I can say, okay, I'm watching the Emmys, the Grammys, whatever, but if they start playing music, that's another type of content which requires another analysis and a lot of people were getting DMCA notices for the music and the other types of content that popped up. So just just keep in mind your uh, your copyright sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> your copyright sandwich. Uh, yeah, we'll have to have a whole episode just called the copyright sandwich. Um, all right, well, so thank you for listening in to Team Gavel today. Uh, we hope you'll visit us on Friday for game day. And we'll be back next Wednesday, next Law Day, with more uh, tips uh, and things to think about. Uh, as always, legal information for you uh, to hopefully you know, perk your ears up when you think of an intellectual property issue and you know who to reach out to. So we hope to hear from you then. Um, 
Thanks, everybody. Follow us. Follow James at uh, on Twitter at BlueJDW. Uh, follow us on TensionWilliams.com, and we will see you around. Let's play this one more time. Legal information is not legal advice specific to your situation.